praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for dying on that cross, but God, thank you for raising him from the dead. Thank you, Lord. You are the only way.
today you have no rival you have no equal and we honor you as the king who is risen and we pray that today in this place that your power will be made known in each and every one of our lives Lord, we pray for those who are our guests today that they would experience all that you are Lord, we pray for those that call real that they call praise assembly home we pray your blessing over them in a special way and lord today let your name and who you are be honored in the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen, amen. It is so good to see each of you today, and uh, we're just glad to have you. Let's take a few moments, and let's greet each other. Uh, God bless you as you do that. Well, good morning. If you could find your seat, that would be fantastic. If you are our guest today, could you do us a favor? It would be such a help to us. If you could complete this Connect card, and uh, this, what this does is it helps us thank you. And uh, also, <clears throat> if you complete it, and you leave today out in the lobby, there is our guest services table. It's right there. It's got three lights hanging over it. That is a place where you can just give them your card, and they have a gift for you. So you can walk out of here with a gift. I mean, how fantastic is that? So if you could do that for us as a guest today, that would be tremendous. Ushers, thank you for your faithful service to us. We're going to receive our morning tithe and offering. I want to read a very quick passage here from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This is the Apostle Paul talking. And he says this to this church in Corinth. He says, For I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. And I want to encourage you if, you, if you are a person that giving is a part of your habit, it's a part of your worship already, uh, I want to encourage you in this way, that your giving inspires others that are around you. If you're a parent here and you're a giving person, that's going to inspire and encourage your children or your grandchildren to give. If you're uh, a young adult here this morning and you do that, and you're talking about it with different opportunities to give, maybe you're inspiring coworkers, people that you live around and live near. Giving inspires other people. Generosity inspires other people. So I want to encourage you with that today. And if you haven't made a giving, uh, giving a part of your worship, consider that and consider who you, could, who you can inspire in that way. Lord, we honor you today and we thank you for the privilege to be able to give. And I pray that during this time of giving and worship, that you would build your kingdom, accomplish your purposes, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen.
couple of reminders about upcoming events, and there are a number. Um, <clears throat> this next Wednesday, we're continuing a brand new series that we just began called Satisfied. Uh, just, just touched on it this past week. If you haven't been out for a Wednesday night Bible study, come on out. You'll love it. And then the following Wednesday is a special workers, new children workers class uh, to get certified to work with minors. Uh, if you have never been through the class, this is not recertification. This is first time or you're going on the Ranger event in May. Uh, you need to be at that class. April 10, 7 o'clock in the cafe. And then two weeks from today, we have Rudy and Sharon Swanepoel will be with us. Uh, they used to brand themselves as the Wild Africans. Uh, they are from South Africa, and so now they're African Americans, truly African Americans, and they're going to be with us April 14 for two services, and then Monday and Wednesday of that week, April 14, two weeks from today. And then uh, also want to report to you, our missions convention was four weeks ago, March 3rd. We didn't have the numbers for this yet, but I can share them with you now. They're in your bulletin. Our missions giving last year, 2023, placed us in 80th, 80th ranking out of 13,000 Assembly of God churches in total missions giving. That is incredible. That really is incredible. To God be the glory. 80th in the nation out of 13,000 churches and third out of the Pennsylvania-Delaware district, Pennsylvania and Delaware combined, third place out of about 380 churches. So again, to God be the glory. Amen. Um, one final reminder that kids camp, I know it's in July, but the weather is improving and we're going to eventually get to summer, July 8 through 11. You need to register as soon as you can. Uh, there were flyers in the information booth. Make sure you grab one of those. If, you're, if, you're, if you have someone who's uh, just finishing first grade through sixth grade, they can attend and there are scholarships available. So make sure to check that out. Um, at this time, we're going to receive another offering today. On your seat was an envelope, Convoy's One Day to Feed the World. Convoy's One Day to Feed the World. The ushers will prepare in just a moment. I just want to say one thing, or two things. One is, don't, you don't have to bother filling out the, the one side of it. Just put your name there. That's all you need if you're going to use this envelope. We don't want credit card information. Okay, we don't want that. So cash or check, whatever, however you came prepared. And if you weren't prepared, you can give online. We have a giving button for one day to feed the world. So um, if our ushers are about ready, can we go ahead and I want to start out with this video um, and it's it's by King and Country. They had done a, a, um, a, a fundraiser for Convoy. And so uh, one of the leaders shares a little bit and then it goes into a wonderful song about unity. And uh, that's when the ushers will begin to come down. And finally, and awfully importantly, it has a universal and global theme of looking at ourselves, looking around the world and asking ourselves so many questions. Um, one of which I believe we're all asking today, and that is, what can we do about the reality and the tragedy and the hell that Eastern Europe is facing right now? And I'm pleased to share with you, we are partnering with Convoy of Hope that is on the ground in Ukraine. They've been there since 2014 and they are supplying humanitarian aid for so many refugees, be it food uh, or helping families, um, providing the essential needs of so many, down to mothers with babies. And we're inviting you to join us in helping raise money to send over to Convoy of Hope um, to these families in, in very real need. So there's information on your screen about how to do that. One thing we need so deeply and so desperately in this time is a sense of unity. Not uniformity, but unity. And we have a very special guest to help us sing and represent this in a very deep way. So would you help us welcome the world famous and co-writer of this song, Tony Williams. Hey, uh, hey. I wouldn't deny it if you asked me I'd rather die than to blaspheme But if I need a ride in your backseat Will you be there for me? See me on the path on your way home I need a night just to sleep on But if I'm going to dawn, would it be wrong? Will you be there for me? Will you? 
Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of Convoy of Hope. Lord, we thank you for raising up the Donaldson family, Lord, to create such a, such a, a tool to reach the lost and at the same time meet very desperate human need. Even in the cities of America, all the way to Africa, to the Ukraine, as we've heard today, Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing through them. And I pray your blessing, your continued guidance for Hal Donison, especially this morning. Lord, just continue to watch over him in this ministry. And Lord, I pray that, that they truly would be your hands extended where there's human need. We give you praise, Lord, and we thank you for this opportunity for us to join our hands with theirs, Lord, to partner with them in this way. And I pray your blessing upon all that's been given to help them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you again for giving. And uh, if you weren't prepared, again, you can give online uh, through our website. He's risen. Hallelujah. I mean, he's risen. I mean, after all these years, the truth remains. And, you know, <clears throat> before we get into the word this morning, I, I want to express to you a frustration that I think most pastors across our nation feel whenever we approach a holiday like Easter, and this frustration is based simply on an, I guess, on the reality of trying to present a sermon, a message that is centered on an ancient immutable truth that he rose from the dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead trying to present an immutable truth, and yet trying to present it in some new and clever way. I don't want to say fresh, but clever. You know, we pastors really do not like preaching reruns. We really don't. As much as you wouldn't want to hear them, we don't like doing that. We want every one of our messages to be interesting, and we want them to be unique. And yet the fact is, 
that the Easter story is the Easter story. It's the account of our Savior rising from the dead after giving his life as a sacrifice for the sins of man. That's it. I mean, literally, that's, that's all that I would need to do is, is maybe read about the account in the Bible, just remind you of what it means. We could pray and go home and have our ham or lamb or whatever you have today. There really isn't much that you can do to embellish the story, nor do I think we need to. But you know, in my, in my thinking about this perennial dilemma, because this is, this is weeks that I've, been work, I've worked on this weeks back, uh, and as I was putting this message together, I, I, a memory for, came back from, from about 40 years ago. And it is both a sad and funny true story that I want to share with you. Uh, when I was pastoring my first church, I befriended a Unitarian Universalist pastor. And if you don't know, Unitarian Universalists basically believe that there is no God. Okay, they don't believe in a God, but they do believe in a heaven. They don't believe that Jesus was God. They don't believe that he was the son of God. And again, they just don't believe that God exists. It's basically a church for atheists and agnostics. Okay, you do not have to believe in God. But anyway, I used to get together with this Unitarian pastor. And it was just my way of, of hoping to make a difference in his life. Actually witnessing to him. And we'd meet at a local coffee shop. And I remember one spring morning as we, as we were together, he commented, he said, man, I hate this time of year. I mean, whether it was March or April, he said, I hate this time of year. I said, what do you mean? He says, Easter's coming. And so I asked him why. And his response was, I never know what to preach on. It's Easter. He didn't know what to preach on because he didn't believe in a risen Savior. As I said, it's really sad. And so today being Easter, guess what I'm going to preach about? I'm going to preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. And you know what? I do want to be a little bit creative in my message today. And so what I've done is to, to devise a clever little title for my message. My message will be basic. It'll be all about Easter, I promise you. But here's the title I came up with. And listen to this. Listen to this. And I'll explain in a moment. But listen to this. Here's the title. Christmas isn't enough. Isn't that great? I thought about that all by myself. <laughs> Christmas isn't enough. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. But it's true. Christmas isn't enough. And, and let me explain, okay? My explanation begins with Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Philippians 3.10, the Apostle Paul said, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And this is why I can say with all confidence, as wonderful as Christmas is, and as sweet a celebration as it is, it's not enough. It's not enough that a Messiah would be born into our world. In fact, it was only the beginning. Amen? Amen? Because that same Savior would have to suffer. He would have to die in order to, to erase our sins. The sin of Adam and Eve as well as, as our personal transgression. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. The payment and punishment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everyone who has ever been born into our world is in trouble because of sin. Amen. In the Old Testament, the people hoped that animal sacrifice would absolve them of their sin. Look at what Hebrews chapter 10 has to say about this. Hebrews 10 verse 1. It says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. Not the realities themselves. No. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not been stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. 
It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Amen. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will, O God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I've come to do your will. In other words, he set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands, performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He's speaking about Jesus. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has been made perfect forever. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And you know, there's an old, there's a really old hymn the church used to sing, went along with this passage. And it went like this. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that that hymn was written in 1876 by Robert Lowry. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. What a great hymn. No animal sacrifice would suffice. Nothing can take away the sins of man except for the sacrifice of a completely sinless man. You see, Christmas wasn't enough. And so we read in the book of Hebrews, there's only one sacrifice that could make us perfect forever. And that was Jesus' death on the cross. Jesus Christ of Nazareth was born into this world to live among men, to die for men. And of course, meaning men, women, boys, girls, every human being. He came into this world for the sole purpose of dying for the sins of every human being. And when we celebrate Easter, we're celebrating his death because his blood removes our sin. Again, just the book of Hebrews told us there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. Sins cannot be forgiven without the shedding of blood. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he made a way for our sins to be forgiven. And that that would be Good Friday. And you know what? Not only is Christmas not enough, Good Friday is only takes us part of the way there. Because not only must there be the sacrifice of a perfect Messiah, there must be a resurrection. There has to be a resurrection or none of this makes sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses, liars about God, for we've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost, forever lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we, are, we, we, we of all people must, are, most to, are, are to be most pitied. Imagine this. Imagine this. Paul is writing this just years after this event, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, just a few years following Jesus' death and his resurrection, there were people There were pagans and cultists who were teaching that man's sins were forgiven at Jesus' death. That's true. Our sins were forgiven at his death. But they falsely taught that there's no resurrection, that there's no eternal life. This was a popular teaching among the Epicureans, the Sadducees, the Manichaeans. People were teaching this this untruth, this lie. Look once again at the verse we started with, Philippians 3.10. Paul said, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 
We need to know that not only was Jesus Christ born from the Spirit through the woman, but that he also gave his life as a ransom. And then after three days, he rose from the dead. And because he lives, we too shall live. If there is no resurrection, then we, don't, we, then we won't be resurrected. And, and he wouldn't have been resurrected. That's what Paul argued to the Corinthians. To those who are spreading this false doctrine. But Jesus said in John 14, 19, he said it himself. Because he lives, we too get to live. He told us that, that, that we can have hope for eternal life and eternity in heaven. All because he rose from the dead. Because he was resurrected. And that's why today is such an incredible holiday. It's a holy day to celebrate. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15, to have our sins forgiven, but not living forever, Paul said, would make us the most miserable people on the planet. That we should be pitied more than anyone else on this planet. What, I mean, what good is it to have your sins absolved, but never enjoy eternal fellowship with the one who created us? And redeemed us. Really, we would, be, we would be the most destitute and the most pitied of all people. But today we rejoice because our Savior lives. Again, because he lives, we too shall live. He told that to us in the Gospels. One more passage before I close. And this is 1 Corinthians 1.20. It says, where is the wise person? Where, where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. Look at that. The world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jew and Gentile, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. And you know, today, just like back then, there are many beliefs and philosophies in our world. And all of them are deceptive, but one. People can think they're so wise, that they're so understanding. But only one single truth is immutable. And that is that God sent his son to save this world. He was born as an infant in a manger. He led a group of of 12 men, 12 disciples. He was beaten, ridiculed, rejected, and crucified. His body was placed into a borrowed tomb. But then he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. And as we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, just a moment ago, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, he is our holiness, and he's our redemption. Watch this.
Why are you crying? Because they've taken my Lord. And I don't know what they've done with him. Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Sir, if you've taken him, please have pity on me. Just tell me what you've done with him. I will go and find him. Mary. just as we saw in that clip, something changed in Mary once she knew that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Hopelessness was replaced with incredible relief and joy. And for each one of us who already know Jesus as our Savior, we also know that joy deep down inside, don't we? We know that we're only sojourners here on this earth and that heaven's our real home. We know the joys of our sins being forgiven and the promise of eternal life. Christmas wasn't enough. His death on the cross, Good Friday, wasn't enough. Easter, that resurrection moment, is the total fulfillment of God's promise. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. As we're praying right now, I really do believe that just about everyone, if not everyone in this room, knows Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you understand, you understand that it, Jesus died for your sins. He was punished for our transgressions. He died. He was put into a tomb three days later as promised from the Old Testament scriptures. From God's word, he would rise from the dead. And he did. And he showed himself to hundreds of people after his resurrection. Then he ascended into heaven. And he's coming again. He's coming again someday. And then everything will be made new. But I just wonder, as we're, as we're here right now in this moment of prayer, I just wonder if there's someone here this morning... And you've come in here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And maybe you're like that pastor friend that I had, a Unitarian Universalist pastor. You're hoping there's a heaven, but you're not sure that there's a God. Well, let me just say this, that there can't be a heaven without a God. That's just logic. It's not science. It doesn't have to be scriptural. It's just true. There can't be a heaven without a God. And we have a God 
who made a way for every one of us to live in heaven. And so again, if, you, if you've come in here today and you've joined with us today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can ask him to come into your life right now, right here, right where you're seated. But I have to ask you a question. Again, you've come in here today. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Have you ever asked him to come into your life and take charge of your life? To forgive you of all sin and to literally be your Savior and Lord. And you know, if you haven't done that, if you haven't done that, what I'm asking you to do is, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you would raise your hand where you're seated, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, you don't know Jesus Christ your Savior, but you're willing to invite him into your heart and your life today, would you just raise your hand where you're seated? And we'll pray in a moment, and you can invite him into your heart. You can be ready for heaven. Is there, is there even just one here today that would say, Pastor, I, I'm not sure about Jesus. I'm not sure about heaven. But I want to ask him to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. If that's you, just raise your hand quickly. You don't need to hesitate. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you. Father God, for all that you did. From the moment that the first man and woman that you created turned against you. You put a plan in motion that would redeem humanity back to you. And that plan included a perfect sacrifice and you provided it. You've done everything for us. And all we have to do is ask you to come into our lives, to be our savior, to cleanse us of all sin, to forgive us of all sin. You have made a way. And Lord, we thank you for that wonderful truth, for the truth of this Resurrection Sunday. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, but by the absence of any raised hands, that every one of us believes that. Lord, how I pray that when we leave this place, until we celebrate a year from now, that we'll tell others about you, what you've done in our lives, and that you're real, that you're alive, you live forever, and we will live with you forever someday. Lord, we give you all the glory, all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand together. He is risen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, I pray your blessing on the remainder of our day, Lord, being with family and friends. Lord, we ask for your blessing. We ask for your presence. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, for raising Jesus from the dead and that we have that same promise. I pray again your blessing on each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter.